What's up guys? Josh with Survive First Contact. I uh, wanted to go over some stuff with you today because um, it's a recurring theme of something that I see is like the, the kind of spat, the online um, conflict between either current or prior military people and civilian trainers uh, when it comes to training the civilian populace on uh, what I think are kind of universally needed skills regardless of uh, which of those you are and trying to maybe provide some context and some background uh, as to why each one of these types of people, either military law enforcement or prior military, uh, as opposed to maybe uh, just a straight up civilian who doesn't have that level or that type of training. Um, so going through, kind of go through each one of these skill sets and kind of give a little bit of background, uh, specifically why military minded people or military trained people go about uh, training and executing tasks a certain way um, and how those could potentially conflict uh, with a civilian view on things and, and what they each prioritize as important. So the skills I have broken down, and I think regardless of your role, uh, every citizen, every American, whoever you are, doesn't have to be in America, just every citizen somewhere, um, you should be able to do these things if you're talking about surviving and making it through uh, not only some kind of violent event brought on by your fellow man, but like a natural disaster, anything else in the world, anything that can cause you risk, um, you need to be able to do at least one or if not a combination of these things at all times. So the way I broke down the skills, and you've probably heard these a bunch if you uh, uh, train quite a bit, especially in the military community, shoot, move, communicate, sustain and survive, put those together. And then I have down in here environment and mission, uh, looking at what the environment is and what your mission is. And then from down there, how does that shape your perception of risk? So basically what is your role? And how does that determine how you execute each one of these things and where you put the priorities? Uh, priorities I have here, you see down in red, that's the priorities of what I would think most military-minded people place as the first priority, uh, sustain and survive. Um, the old saying that tacticians study tactics and strategists study logistics, uh, you win wars with logistics. Uh, more or less, who can get more people um, to the fight more efficiently, more quickly, and uh, better supplied, meaning how long can they sustain that fight? Uh, from a very general perspective, that's what wins wars. Now, that's excluding, you know, superior skills of, of things like special operations and, and other kinds of uh, very specific cases that here we're just going over generalities. Um, but sustain and survive, mainly because that falls into every task. Every one of these tasks, you need some kind of sustainment. Um, you need supplies, you need a continuous stream of them uh, if they're supplies that you that you go through quickly, food, water, other um, batteries, things that you're going to go through, you need a constant sustainment of that, uh, as well as survival items and survival skills. Um, doesn't matter if you can make it to the fight or not, if you don't have the things to get you out the door, those all those sustainment functions, uh, to at least get you a baseline to get set up to do what it is you're supposed to do, conduct movement there, um, be able to, to sustain movement if movement is over a long distance or for a long time. Um, once you get there, depending on how long execution of the mission takes, uh, can you sustain through that whole thing and then have the sustainment piece for something to either come get you or you, you know, walk your happy ass out with your, with your backpack um, and then get back to reset and do it again and do you have the sustainment and the ability uh, to prep to do it again if it's an ongoing thing. Uh, so that's kind of the military perspective on sustain and survive. Um, that's priority one. Shifting over to civilians, and I apologize if I jump around. Um, shifting over to civilians, what I see commonly, um, and it's not everybody, and it's not a knock on civilians uh, by any means, tend to prioritize number one as shooting. Uh, being able to shoot marksmanship, buying equipment uh, that is guns, optics, lasers, um, shooting related stuff tends to be the number one. Um, and I can understand that because before I was in the army, surprise, surprise, I was a civilian. I grew up hunting and shooting um, and wanted to serve. And that's how I also ultimately ended up in the military and uh, ended up with some additional skills. That's the civilian world as a hunter and a shooter prior, I was able to bring those skills in the military and it helped me. But at any, and it, yeah, at any rate, looking at why um, a civilian would prioritize the shooting piece, well, one, it's fun. You know, getting on the range is awesome. Burning the ammo down is great. Um, 
it's sexy. Shooting gear is sexy to look at. Everybody posts their photos and, you know, set up a photo shoot with their Daniel Defense AR and their newest SIG pistol uh, and all that stuff. It's sexy. It's fun. It's cool to look at. Um, and it's fun to do as a hobby. Uh, but realistically, if we're talking about preparing for all of these things. It's just one part of the entire picture. Um, so there's that. And then comparing that, if you were to go down to sustain and survive, which I would say is priority one and common to all of these tasks, um, one, survival stuff isn't cheap. If you look at something like just a sleep system, like a good down sleeping bag, uh, a good tent, a tarp, um, ways to make fire, uh, things like uniforms, boots, uh, layers for harsh weather conditions, either wet or cold, um, all that stuff is generally more expensive and it's not fun, right? Like you buy it and you need it and you know if you've been in the elements, I'm sure plenty of civilians have been in the elements. I know coming from upstate New York, it's cold as shit in the wintertime. I know about the elements too. Um, it's just not great. It's not fun, sexy to buy that kind of stuff. And let's face it, for most civilians, like I said, we're going to jump around here, the environment and the mission, perception of risk, uh, most civilians, it, unless you're planning for an outright revolution or occupation of your country, you don't need to be out in the field for days at a time. Uh, you can go home, dry off, change your clothes, do what you're going to do, uh, unless it is that, you know, type of, there's going to be an uprising, a revolution, um, either from, from an outside invasion or from within, and you need to be able to sustain and conduct more military type activities, I would think priorities would shift more towards the military side. Uh, but that's where I see kind of those priorities hash out. So I kind of already alluded to it, but I would say second priority for military folks from a mission planning perspective uh, is going to be looking at the environment. What is your mission? And then how does that drive your perception of risk? And what risk are you willing to take? Uh, so beginning with environment, when I say the environment here, either hostile or permissive. Military folks, we train to deploy, right? Unless you're in the National Guard or, or you know, what have you. Uh, military people in many government agencies that perform duties overseas, that is their primary role is overseas. Uh, they're not planning to do this in America, which means for the most part, um, the environment might be permissive, like they can move around on the ground and maybe not be armed and not have to be because the threat level isn't that high. Most of the time, military people are planning for a hostile environment. Um, so that means they can't move, on, move around freely. They're gonna have to be armed. They're gonna have to have body armor on probably a lot of the time. They're gonna have to be carrying things with them so that if they're caught in combat basically by surprise, they can sustain themselves to fight their way out of it. Uh, and again, like I said, military or other agencies that work outside the United States, preparing for that war. Is war happening? Okay, then probably prioritize the way military does versus we look at like a first responder type scenario, uh, which is where your, more of your civilians are going to fall or military while they're home. Um, that's a big thing now for myself, uh, being able to provide basic medical aid and sustainment and survival stuff for me and my family, my tribe, and training people, and that's what I'm passionate about. Um, but as far as that first responder role goes from a civilian perspective, if you're not planning for war, and you're not planning that you know that hostile environment, and the environment is permissive, you can walk around out in town and uh, no one's hunting you, um, then yes, again, prioritizing the shooting portion, maybe not as important as the sustain or survive portion, uh, and maybe not as important as the rest of these facets that we have listed. But again, it goes back to that perception of risk, right? So in a hostile wartime environment, uh, military is taking on a certain level of risk, whether they want to or not. You know, you're in a bad place. Uh, you're there because all the diplomatic avenues have failed. Um, so your risk perception is things are inherently risky. Uh, so you're going to do things to prevent or mitigate risk at every turn, which is going to drive uh, you wanting to sustain and survive. Because if you are cut off somewhere or just doing military activities, and you can't do that, even without someone shooting you, you're not gonna make it. Uh, moving into uh, the shoot, move, and communicate portion, like I said, military planning for a hostile environment in wartime. Um, moving up to shoot, move, communicate, I have these all kind of listed three, four, and five together for military priorities, um, because they're all, to me, they're kind of interchangeable. All of these could take precedence before one another, and I think you really need to do all of these. Um, one, you need to be a marksman. Uh, but I would almost say that your ability to move and maneuver is almost more important than your marksmanship um, because gunfights, unless it's in that maybe that first responder type setting, uh, in a military setting, gunfights are longer, more drawn out things with multiple people. Uh, military people aren't working alone, they're working in small teams at the very smallest element and more like 
team squads, platoons, maybe, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 people. Um, so then prioritizing this maneuver piece, the move piece, uh, one, be able to get you to the fight, and two, be able to maneuver in the fight. Because you have, in a gunfight in the military, that probably that fire team type um, dynamic, right? So you have some guys that can shoot for cover, basically send some rounds, covering fire, get the enemy to keep their head down, while another portion maneuvers to get to an advantageous position to engage that enemy and destroy him. Um, from a, you know, a civilian perspective, if you're not at war and there's not some kind of uprising going on, you know, it's a permissive environment, you're probably just in that first responder type mode. So the move piece uh, might be less tactical, right? Uh, because you don't have to move super slowly and deliberately scanning for all kinds of threats um, if you're moving towards maybe like an active shooter type event that is outside, right? You hear some gunshots, you hear screaming, um, you're an armed and trained citizen, you're going to go respond. Um, yeah, so at that point, yeah, don't move tactically from far away. Haul ass to get, you know, into the vicinity, and then when you're in the vicinity, now switch on that tactical brain and realize that you have to be scanning for threats, taking in as much information as you can in that moment, uh, so you can determine who a threat is and who isn't, and what is happening, are there bystanders, that's, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, but I can see that, you know, driving a civilian mindset of why they don't need to move slowly or tactically everywhere. Whereas military, like I said, you're in a high threat situation. All movements outside the gate or outside the wire you hear a lot are going to be tactical because you don't know around what corner, what wall, behind what rock or bend in the road that someone is trying to kill you. <clears throat> so that tactical mindset is more switched on all the time and that drives a lot of the military mindset of, you know, these civilians are running drills too quickly, they're moving too fast to shoot, um, they're not maneuvering properly. Like I said, they're coming from that mindset of is the entire environment around them is a potential threat. So they're going to take tactical action, uh, do tactical things that are deliberate that mitigate their risk or their perception of the risk of what's happening. Uh, communicate piece. Um, like I said, shoot, move, communicate from military perspective, kind of all in the same bucket to me anyways because... Uh, you can destroy people with communication, seeing a lot of JTACs get on the radio and drop bombs and kill a lot of dudes without firing a shot. Um, like I said, movement, you can kill people without moving, again, with a communicate piece. Um, and then if you're in person, uh, I've seen, you know, gunfights happen where someone shooting static uh, isn't engaged appropriately, they don't engage the threat, and they have to maneuver to be able to get to an advantageous position to then destroy the threat. So like I said, those are all kind of the same bucket for me. But at any rate, communication. Um, communication from a military perspective super important because one, once you step outside that wire, uh, the radio, that pace plan, that primary alternate contingency and emergency forms of communication that you have planned for, those are your lifelines back to a base. And not only back to a base, uh, but to air support, uh, to a medical evacuation, helicopter, an ambulance, one of, your, uh, one of your people gets hit, being able to communicate back to someone higher, super important. And if you're not communicating back with someone higher, communicating within your team of people, right? Because military setting in the hostile war environment, you're not moving by yourself. You need to be able to communicate within a small team because the power is in your small team. Uh, you don't need to be able to shoot super accurately-ish uh, if you have a team of 10 people shooting. Um, and if you're gonna send people to maneuver, you may not be shooting to kill somebody. You may be shooting to suppress them. It's just things that a civilian is very likely not going to have to do. Uh, so that isn't in their their tactical calculus, we'll say. Yeah, so for the communication piece, again, from the from the civilian perspective, uh, looking at that, maybe it's communication with first responders, uh, planning for that, having something like a cell phone or push-to-talk radios or ham radios with a, some kind of civilian emergency band, if that exists. Uh, don't quote me on that one. Um, but, you know, there's your reason why military is going to prioritize means of communication over, you know, your traditional kind of the way military sea civilians is I'm just going to spend a lot of money on guns and Gucci gear um, and it's just bullshit. They don't know what they're doing. Again, just kind of this breakdown to kind of get out of the mindset that military and prior military veterans versus civilians. It shouldn't be that type of situation, right? Like we should be learning from each other. Uh, I can tell you right now, I would hugely benefit from taking something like shooting classes from professional sponsored shooters. Um, or even, you know, superior tier one military unit guys. Um, those two classes of shooters have shot way more than I have, and I've shot quite a bit. Um, but again, looking at these and what I would suggest doing, 
as yourself for your own personal training plan and so you don't view the other side, so to speak, as the other side. We're all in this together, right? Um, break down your training into one, building each one of these skills individually and then for the sustain and survive portion of it, um, building up your equipment stores, so that, you know, split between kind of like basic survival stuff that you can survive in any environment um, if you were out exposed without shelter basically for an extended period. Uh, could you build a fire? Could you purify water? Could you set up a shelter? Um, could you signal for help? Um, could you treat a, a, you know, a basic injury versus could you treat a traumatic injury like a bleeder from an artery um, or a gunshot wound? Looking at building all of those individual skills and then looking at them in a collective way and you know, depending on which side of, of the fence you think you're on, now consider in your own planning and how you do your training and what you purchase are you planning for something like a hostile environment, like a wartime environment, that that needs to drive your tactics? Or is it, like you said, you're a civilian in your hometown and it's a permissive environment. No one's hunting you, no one's trying to kill you. Build your tactics off of, okay, I can move freely um, and now I just have to enact my plan when some kind of event happens that I have planned for. When I say planned for, you're not waiting for the event to happen. You're not like, oh, I know this bad stuff's gonna happen and I'm gonna respond. It's a planned response for a series of events that you could foresee happening uh, and then have rehearsed for that and have equipment staged for that where it's appropriate so you can get at that equipment in a timely manner and respond the way you need to. Uh, back one with the hostile, is it a wartime environment? You know, even in a civilian type setting, look at, look at Ukraine right now with a Russian invasion. Um, that is a civilian populace, at least a portion of it, that's still stuck in those places that is Russian occupied. So even though it's, it's very much civilian, uh, you're not a permissive environment, you are hostile and you're at war. And if you want to plan for something like that, then you need to start taking into consideration um, how military plans, sustains, and executes. Um, you know, and then same with, with the first, first responder perspective uh, for civilians or for military when you're off duty. Uh, big thing with first responder is ensuring that you've rehearsed all the activities you're gonna do, like say emergency trauma medical treatments um, rehearse all those treatments, uh, know what to look for, and have all the tools you need close by, you know, at arm's length. You can grab it within a couple seconds and put it into action because in this kind of uh, situation, um, seconds determine how the outcome is. Same thing if you're a first responder and it's something like an active shooter. Um, like we talked about the movement piece. You're military, maybe you're taught to move slow and deliberate um, because the environment's hostile, you don't know what's around. Civilian or military off-duty, first responder, active shooter, uh, who cares about moving tactically? Get to the crisis point and be able to respond. Um, but again, this all kind of comes down to what is the environment you're in? What is the mission? Uh, maybe you don't have a mission. No one's dictating that you're going to do something for a mission. But what do you think your mission is? What are those types of events or scenarios that you could foresee happening? And then how does that drive your risk perception? And you need to build your equipment stores and your training and your rehearsals based off of that. Uh, because simply, you know, one side poking at the other side on um, Instagram videos of, oh, this guy shouldn't have done this, or, you know, so, civilians trying to demonstrate a shooting drill and some military guy pops in. It's like, you would never do that in war. It's like, maybe that guy isn't training for war. Maybe he's training to do just this piece. Or same from the military perspective, a civilian's watching military guys move slowly up the street during a gunfight. It's like, well, why would they move quickly? They're being shot at. It's like, well, in that case, because military's in a small team and they have barrels pointed in all directions, they have better security with multiple people pointing barrels in multiple directions than they do if everyone was just running and not able to engage anything accurately. So I hope this has helped guys. Um, just just a little piece of, of the entire puzzle, but you know, trying to look at this holistically from all sides and say that we are not separate military or veterans and civilians. There's a lot of civilian veterans out there. Um, just know that we're all kind of in the same boat um, and poking holes at each other as long as it's constructive, is solid. Um, but if not, we're just, you know, we're catfight on the internet uh, and everybody loses that way and everybody looks like a pussy because you're catfighting on the internet. Don't catfight on the internet. Train, plan, and prepare for those situations, whatever you think your mission is, be able to do it in that environment. Assess your risk and then build how you do these based off of that and you won't be wrong. It'll be tactically sound no matter what you're doing. Hope that's helped, guys. Peace, stay safe out there.